Think of all the things that you planted in me. Thanks for the way that you've loved me, instilled values that have shaped me, and planted spiritual seeds that have grown. Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day! I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. We couldn't have said it better ourselves. Moms, happy Mother's Day. We love you and we just think the world of you. Uh, we know this day comes with some mixed feelings for some. You know, you're living uh, really uh, in, a, in a joyous way and others, maybe this brings up some feelings of loss or pain. Uh, maybe some of you have longed to have a family of your own, but we just wanna know, let you know to all women out there that we, uh, we love you and uh, we ask that the Lord would bless you today and that uh, you would experience some of the love of Jesus uh, here today. We wanna welcome the rest of you uh, to Christ's Community Church and our Church at Home weekend experience. Uh, we're so glad that you're joining us, something we do as we gather in living rooms and places all across the Omaha area and parts of our country as we, uh, we just ask for you to engage with us as, as uh, we go through some songs together, some moments, some teaching later from Mark. And uh, right now, would you just, uh, if you're comfortable to stand or uh, just open your hearts to sing with us, we're gonna sing a few songs that worship God, lift up his name. So join us now.
stop the Lord Almighty? Who can 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 stop the Lord? sing that I will rest in your promises my confidence oh it's your faithfulness well, I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness oh, I will rest in your promises your faithfulness you are faithful you are faithful forever you will be faithful you are 
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a faithful God. Thank you for being with us through every moment. Lord Jesus, today we think of all of the moms out there. We think of all the sisters, all the daughters, all the grandmothers, all of the women, Lord. We think of each woman watching this all the women in our lives, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for placing these women in our lives, Lord. I pray that each woman watching knows that she is cherished and beloved by you. God, she is cherished and beloved by others. So Jesus, will you just show us your perfect love right now in this moment? Come, Holy Spirit, please show us that perfect love. Lord, I pray for all the men and women watching that each of us knows that yes, we, we may have support around us on this day, but Lord, we always have support from you. You are always there with your perfect love, your perfect peace, your perfect rest. So Jesus, come and just wash us over with all of those perfect things that can only come through you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. Amen. We're just gonna go ahead and take a moment. Let's just take a moment to sit and think through our past week. Maybe for some of you, it was a week with a lot of ups and downs. Maybe it was the hardest week so far of this quarantine. Maybe it was the easiest week and you were surprised. Let's just take a moment to just think through the details of this week. And let's just sit back and ask, Lord Jesus, where were you? Where were you in those moments? How were you interacting in my life and the lives of those around me? And maybe it was a letter from a neighbor. Maybe they came and knocked on your window and it, it made your day. Maybe you got a text message from a friend from years ago that you never thought that you would stay in contact with them ever again. Maybe it was reconciliation with a family member you didn't deem possible. Maybe it was a smile from someone at a grocery store. I don't know what that was, but the Lord is in your life working and moving. So Jesus, please give us eyes to see the way that you're working in our lives. Lord Jesus, you are faithful. You are faithful in the ups and downs, so help us see that. Help us see your faithfulness in this season. And if you'll join me, we're gonna go ahead and sing Great Is Thy Faithfulness with two amazing sisters, Debbie and Ruth. Changes not 
Good day, everyone. My name is Steve. I'm sta on staff here at Christ Community Church. And first of all, I'd like just to give a shout out to my mom. Mom, I love you. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, mom is in a retirement community in Lincoln, Nebraska. And she's been isolated in her room for weeks. And that's kind of a tough go. And I know she's not alone. But uh, when I call her, she still is chipper and upbeat and uh, I just appreciate that about her. So happy Mother's Day, Mom. And greetings to all of you who are joining us today, wherever that might be. Some of you are across the metro area. Some of you are uh, spread across this great country. And some of you are overseas. And we're glad you're with us. We'd like to know who you are. And so we encourage you to follow the I'm New instructions on your screen. It might be a great next step for you into into community. Well, that song that Debbie and Ruth just did, I mean, that could be or maybe even should be a theme song for our church in recent weeks, for God is faithful, and he's been faithful to us, especially through this these last few weeks with church at home, and uh, we are putting all of our trust in God as a church, for we have found him trustworthy uh, time and time again over the years for his provision for us. I'd like to share with you just a few uh, financial uh, pieces of news. First of all, the, the staff has worked hard at uh, making some adjustments in their budgets so that we can reduce um, the overall spending here at Christ Community Church. Uh, second of all, the, the payroll protection, protection plan, we approved that this past Sunday as a church, and so that is allowing the staff to continue to be hired and to continue to be paid. And finally, and I think the most important thing is all of you, you have continued to be generous and faithful uh, in your giving. And I trust, I think it's been cheerful giving also as an act of worship. 82% of you now are giving online, and many of you have stepped up and made that change just in recent weeks. So overall, we say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, uh, for he has been so uh, good, good to us. And uh, we just thank you for your continued partnership in the ministry here at Christ Community, what God is doing through our church for his kingdom and for his purposes. If some of you have not uh, begun giving online. You'd like to do that. It's a very simple thing, but if you'd like to call the church, we'd be uh, just more than happy to help you step through that and get started that way. Well, we're going to continue now with our series, Walking Through Philippians. Uh, what a joy it has been, a very joy-filled book. It's called House Arrest. And before Pastor Mark comes, uh, let's, let's bow our heads in prayer, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we just stand back and we say, great is thy faithfulness, both as individuals and as a church that we can, we can proclaim that uh, this morning. And you are sovereign, you are on the throne, and no matter what might be going on, we acknowledge that. And Lord, we pray especially um, for those who need a, a healing touch from you. Uh, both physically and emotional during these difficult days. We play, pray for our elderly and those um, who just need a word of encouragement. I pray that you would keep them from fear and keep them from anxiety. And we pray for your, your provision. So many people, their lives have really been turned upside down financially, and life is kind of hard right now. Um, and there can be a lot of strain and a lot of stress in the families. And so would you bring your supernatural sense of peace 
a peace that passes all understanding into their lives during these days. And Lord, we now pray for uh, this message. We pray as we look closely at this section of scripture. And God, may we kind of put blinders on right now. May we lean in a little bit to our device, our laptop, our TV. What would you have for us today? What would you have for us? And so we trust you and we ask all these things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen and amen, and thank you very much, Steve. And happy Mother's Day to all of you who are out there. I want to give a special shout out to four mothers that are in my life. Uh, first of all, to my mom, Anne, who gave me birth and raised me up all the way in Champaign, Illinois. Happy Mother's Day to you. To my mother-in-law, Augie, who invited me into their family and has blessed me for 30 years now. And to my stepmother, Mary, who is in Bloomingdale, Illinois, grateful for you and your role in my life. And finally, to my beautiful wife, the mother of my children, Kelly, you have been a blessing in our kids' life and in my life every single day. So happy Mother's Day to each of you. I love you very much. And I just want to say to the church as well that I miss you guys. Uh, before I get into the message, I just need to let you know, I miss seeing kids run around in the atrium. I miss high-fiving people in the hallways. I miss our seniors walking in with their walkers. I miss all of your beautiful faces. I miss hugs from guys like Sam McKinley, uh, who lost his beautiful wife, Carol, this week. And Sam, our hearts go out to you, and we love you, and we're praying for you this week. I miss my special friends who give me special greetings every week. And I miss the day spring class who gets here at an ungodly early hour in order to have your class before the services start. I just miss all of you, my friends, and yearn for the day that we can all be together once again. And once it's appropriate and safe and so forth, we will. But in the meantime, my affection goes deeply out to all of you. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and summarize our sermon for this morning in five words as we begin. Uh, the five words are, you can predict your future. Believe it or not, you really can predict your future. I think it's biblical, and we'll teach into that a little bit later today, but it's good news because people have been trying to predict their future for years and years. I mean, whether you're talking about Chinese fortune cookies or for, or uh, 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 fortune tellers, or people using tarot cards. It's not just something people do, it's big business. Uh, late night people with their call-in lines, or the uh, downtown shops where people will bring out tarot cards, or tell your fortune there is money to be made because people want to have their fortunes told. And it goes back to ancient times. You know, in ancient times, in biblical times, they used to cut open sheep, slice their liver in half, and look at the entrails of the animal to see what their future would be. In many other tribal communities, they'd look up to the sky, and they would see the birds flying in the air, and they would think that the birds' patterns were omens as to what their future should look like. Even today, one of the common future-telling things is astrology. <laughs> I mean, I think you guys know there's some people who literally look at their horoscopes every day to help figure out what to do for that day or maybe to justify their bad moods or whatever it is. My Capricorn is rising into my Mercury, so I had to act that way. I even think of uh, people looking for dates based on their uh, horoscopes. I think of uh, this little meme that I ran across this week that has a woman saying to a man, what's your zodiac sign? The smart Alex says, dinosaur. <laughs> she says, but that one doesn't even exist. And he responds, none of them exist. <laughs> I don't know if that cracks you up. That just cracked me up this week as I was reading it. I hope you like memes. Okay. And just because you're begging for it, I'm going to give you a bonus. Bonus joke this morning as we start things off. A golfer goes to a fortune teller. Okay, a golfer goes to a fortune teller and he says to her, I really only have one question for you, and that is, are there golf courses in heaven? Can we golf in heaven? So she says, mm, let me see, and she pulls out her crystal ball and looks, and she says, I have good news for you and bad news for you. And uh, he says, okay, hit me with the good news. She says, the good news is there are golf courses in heaven. They are long and they are lush and beautiful, and when you go, you hit them long and straight. 
He says, that sounds awesome. What's the bad news? She says, you have a tea time tomorrow at 8.30. Yeah, huh? okay, groaner. I got a little bit of a chuckle on that one. I could feel it. I could feel it even from here. Hey, God forbids all of these methods in Scripture. You know, divination, fortune telling, medium spiritus, all this stuff is forbidden in the Bible. Why? Because it's fake. <laughs> Because it just doesn't work, because it's made up, and God does not want us to give our lives to things that simply aren't true. He wants us to live into the truth, and yet there is this sense that you can predict your future. People want to. I mean, even think about the stock market. How many people would love to be able to time the market? And you know, the market hates uncertainty in culture. When the certainty about what's happening in this world goes down, the stock market goes down. When certainty goes up, the stock market goes up. Good or bad, if people feel like they can count on their future, they feel like they can invest in their life. And it's not just true in the stock market, it's true in other areas of life as well. So we're gonna jump in and take a look at Philippians chapter one, where Paul talks about how you can predict your future. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. If you want to pull out your phones or something to follow along, we're going to live in these verses in Philippians 1, beginning at verse 18, throughout the entire morning. And while we read, I want you to look for four ways, at least, that Paul is predicting his future in these passages. Four ways he's predicting his future. And I've invited to read here today Casey Ashton, my daughter who lives in Georgia, as a nod not only to my beautiful wife, but also to all moms who are out there whose kids are in different cities here today. Here's Casey reading our scripture for us. Philippians 1, 18 through 26. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. Because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. All right, well, thank you, Casey. And I hope that you guys saw them. I hope that you saw at least four different ways. You could probably find some more that are in that passage that predict the future. Now, it's interesting because Paul didn't predict his circumstances, but he did predict his responses to those circumstances, which would define the quality of his life. Look again at your text. In verse 18, you'll see that Paul predicts these responses. Verse 18, he says, I will rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, he says. Then in verse 9, he says, this will turn out for my deliverance. He's looking at his future. It's going to turn out for my deliverance. Verse 20, I will not be ashamed, he confidently predicts. I will not be ashamed. And verse 21, Christ will be magnified in my life. Whether by life or by death, Christ will be magnified. Four future predictions that he gives in this passage. And those four future predictions all have the word, notice, will in there. So go ahead in your Bible, and if you've got your Bible and a pencil, just underline the word will, because that is a tip-off to a prediction about the future. Now, the truth of the matter is, you cannot control your future trials, but you can predict how you will respond to those trials. You can't choose your circumstances, but you can choose your reactions to them. You can't decide how your life will run, but you can decide how to run your life. Why does Paul do this? Why does he approach the future with such confidence? Well, I love the words of Corey Ten Boom, who said this. Even though we do not know what the future holds, we know 
who holds the future. Isn't that good? You can be confident about your future because you know who holds the future. And so Paul predicts four things about himself. And what himself? What I want to do is I want to attach a word that goes with each of those, those four phrases to make it a little bit more memorable for our time here today. So the first phrase is, I will rejoice. And the key word there is joy. Somebody say joy. joy. All right, pretty good, pretty good. Next time, see if you can do it a little bit better. Next one, this will turn out. The key word is hope. Somebody say hope. Good. I will not be ashamed. The key word is confidence. Someone say confidence. confidence. Good. And the fourth one is Christ will be magnified by life or by death. And the key word is life. Somebody say life. life. Good. Joy, hope, confidence, life. It's a pretty good future, right? And you don't need to know forever. You don't need to know the long range of your future to be able to predict those things. You can live your life one day at a time and just say, this day, tomorrow, I will choose joy. I will choose hope. I will choose confidence. I will choose life. Abraham Lincoln, I think many of you know, was a man of God and a president of our United States who presided in very tough times. I mean, there was a civil war that was going on. The nation was deeply divided. People were dying. There was much uncertainty about the future. But here's what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, the best thing about the future is that it only comes one day at a time. And when we engage in our lives, yeah, I ask the question, what if you never got caught up in the long-run view of worry because you were just confident day-to-day -day in these four things, joy, hope, confidence, and life. And if you could guarantee those things in your life, you would be living a pretty good life with your head held high. Now, don't think Paul had it easy. Paul was facing a lot of uncertainty at his time as well. In fact, you'll remember that Paul is under house arrest at this time. He's about to go to trial before, of all people, Nero, who was the Caesar at the time. Paul's about to face Nero, and we know that Paul's future had two paths, exonerate or exterminate. It was going to be one of those two things, exonerate or exterminate. If he was found innocent, he would be exonerated, he'd walk around free, and he could freely preach the gospel. Or if he was exterminated, he would likely face torture and death. Because many of you know that Nero, during the time that he ruled, when he reigned, he was kind of psycho. He, he was mentally disturbed, and he did not like Christians very much. Nero is the Caesar who blamed the burning of Rome on the Christians, and oftentimes had them thrown into the arena, where they had to fight unfair battles and die in front of the people torn apart by lions or other pieces of torture. Here's what Cornelius Tacitus, a Roman historian, said about Nero and Christians. He said this, Besides being put to death, they were made to serve as objects of amusement. They were clothed in the hides of beasts and torn to death by dogs. Others were crucified. Others set on fire to serve to illuminate the night when daylight had failed. So Paul is awaiting his trial and possible torture and possible execution when he says these things. Kind of puts it all into perspective, doesn't it? Now let's go through each of these four key components one at a time. The first one, I will rejoice, which is capitalized by the word joy. Now you may not know your future, but you can predict a response of joy. I will rejoice and I will continue to rejoice, Paul says. Now, joy is an act of the will that's tethered to something much deeper than happiness. Don't confuse joy and happiness. In a survey of uh, American adults, when they were asked, what is the one thing that you want most out of life? You know what the number one answer was? I want to be happy. That was the number one answer. Now, happiness is something that is tied into circumstances, but joy is so much deeper. Joy is present regardless of your circumstances. Happiness is externally triggered. You get a new car, you're happy. You start seeing the payments, you're not so happy anymore. 
It's based on your circumstances. But joy is internally triggered, and that's why you can choose joy. That's why you can even predict joy in your life. Happiness has its source in events. Joy has its source in God. And this is why Paul can say, nothing can steal my joy. And you could say that about your life as well. Nothing can steal your joy because it doesn't matter how your circumstances go in your life. You can experience joy because of the life of God inside of you, regardless of how your circumstances go. That's why joy is better than happy. Second thing Paul says you can have is hope. I know that this will turn out. Here's the full verse where it says, verse 19, I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So Paul is confident. He's confident because this has been bathed in prayer. He knows that the Philippians have been praying for him. And if you have the combination of faith-filled prayer and the object of faith is the spirit of Jesus himself, Paul says, I'm confident that faith-filled prayer plus the spirit of Jesus will result in my deliverance. Now, it's interesting because that word deliverance is very similar to salvation. The phrase that Paul is using in this passage is actually borrowed from the book of Job, where Job, even in the midst of all of his pain and difficulty, said, what has happened will turn out for my deliverance. So he's kind of given a nod backwards to the book of Job, saying, Job had it bad, I've got it bad, we're both going to be delivered, we're both going to be saved, I'll experience salvation. But you go, where's Paul's logic in all of this? I mean, I'm going to be saved either way, you're about to go on trial. Well, situation number one is that he will be saved from the wrath of the Roman Empire. He'll be able to be exonerated and walk around like a free man and preach the gospel. Situation number two is that he will be saved even though he's killed, even though he dies. What will he be saved from? He'll be saved from this broken down body of death. He'll be saved from a sin-scarred world. He'll be saved from all of the pain of what it means to be in prison. He will be saved in a much bigger way. So Paul's saying, I am confident and I eagerly hope that all of this is going to turn out for my deliverance. That is real hope. Hope that says, whether by life or by death, the situations are going to turn out for my deliverance. It's a win-win situation. And it comes because of their prayers and the Spirit of God that's at work inside of him. It reminds me of the theme verse of the Christian Missionary Alliance that says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. It reminds me of this phrase that it depends on where you look to be able to find hope as to whether you will find that hope. Your outlook is determined by your uplook. The way that you view the future is dependent on your view of God. And if you believe that God is good and he's involved, then your future looks bright no matter what happens in your circumstances. This is why G.K. Chesterton said the phrase, what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. What you believe about God is the most important thing about you. It determines everything, whether by life or by death. Even if Paul dies. His hope is in God. Even if you die, even if you get sick, even if you lose a job, even if cancer comes, some people see their deliverance by having a healing in 20 more years on planet Earth. Some people have their deliverance by getting to be face to face with their maker. Either way, what has happened will turn out for your deliverance. You can live with a high quality of hope. And hope becomes even more necessary when we're in the midst of a crisis. I think of the crisis that we're in the midst of today. There is a massive difference between people who live with hope and people who do not live with hope. It's probably illustrated really well in the story of Apollo 13, the spacecraft that went into air and had a crisis of its own. And the way that you respond makes all the difference. We'll find out in this story that's delivered by my son Caleb from Lexington, Kentucky. 
Apollo 13 was the seventh crewed mission in the Apollo program, and the third intending to land on the moon. The craft launched from Kennedy Space Center April 11th, 1970, but was aborted after an oxygen tank in the service module failed two days into the mission. The crew instead did a dramatic slingshot maneuver around the moon to land safely back on Earth on April 17th, an incredibly dangerous and challenging feat. The Apollo 13 crew knew that they were running low on oxygen and battery power. They remained helpless, huddled together, waiting for NASA to determine when or if it would be possible to land safely back on Earth. NASA's ground crew, led by veteran flight director Dean Kranz, desperately scrambled for solutions. You can imagine the tension mounting as the hours ticked by. As the spacecraft neared the critical moment of re-entry, a senior leader nervously commented, this could be the worst disaster NASA has ever seen. His doom and gloom comment was immediately countered as Dean Kranz responded, with all due respect, sir, I believe this could be our finest hour. Kranz made it clear throughout the whole ordeal that failure is not an option. Then he confidently led his team to improvise, adapt, and ultimately create a path for the spacecraft to land safely. The difference between Kranz and the other guy? Hope. When you're in the middle of a crisis, who do you want to be with? Someone who's got hope or somebody who doesn't? I think of Kranz, man, I'd want to be with him. Where he says failure is not an option. This could be our finest hour versus the other senior official. We don't know his name. I just call him Eeyore, who says this could be the worst disaster NASA has ever faced. Man, the way that you respond to the world in terms of hope makes a difference in your trajectory because people who have hope begin to act as though there is hope and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They act on their hope and their biggest challenge actually becomes their finest hour. And this kind of hope leads to confidence, which is our third point. Paul says, I will not be ashamed. Longer it says this, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's hope led the confidence that he will no longer be ashamed, that when he came before Caesar, he would not shrink back, but that he would actually tell the greatest story that was ever told. I mean, he could be very nervous before Caesar. The last thing that he wanted to do was to have any kind of shame in the gospel. When he possibly went to his death, the last thing that he wanted to do was ever to act in such a shameful or cowardly way that would bring shame to the gospel. Paul was under real difficult circumstances, and yet this time, like any time in his life, he says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way be ashamed. He had confidence in the gospel and his ability to promote it because it was the best thing ever. That which brings hope and peace and life. So why would you ever be quiet? We live in a world that is filled with needs. People who are desperate and lonely and hurting, and especially this month. Friends, we have got to grow in our boldness to affiliate with Jesus, to promote Jesus, and to love people in Jesus' name. Because in a generation begging for answers, Christians are stuttering. Paul says, that's not me. It's my eager expectation and hope that I would be bold. In our culture, we're surrounded by people who don't share our viewpoint. And they're bold about it. People in our culture are bold to share their views on promiscuity or abortion or racism. They're not ashamed to use every song, every news program, every sitcom, every piece of late night comedy to promote their ideas. But while the culture is breaking bad, we need to be breaking bold. We need to bring the good news of Jesus to contrast the bad news that's there in the world. I was struck this week by the bad news of a young man by the name of Ahmaud Arbery. He was a young football star out for a run in his rural Georgia town when he was brutally shot by two men, a father and son. The death is tragic. The murder is inexcusable. 
but it gets complicated because the man who was shot is black, and the people who did the shooting are white and well-connected in their city government and with the police force. So it was two months, two months before these men were even arrested. And that only after video evidence came out on social media. Friends, racism and power brokering are alive and well. And part of the good news that we bring is saying, I am not ashamed to speak for the truth, to speak for justice, to speak for racial reconciliation, to speak for people who are poor or oppressed or treated unjustly in Jesus' name. Part of bowing to the king involves standing for justice for people regardless of color. I am not ashamed of the gospel and I am not ashamed of its implications. And that leads us to our fourth point. We've got joy, we've got hope, we have got confidence. The fourth point is life, life. Paul is very aware that after this trial, he could wind up dead. It's important to note that Paul isn't contemplating suicide in this matter when he talks to live as Christ and to die as gain. He's contemplating his own potential execution. And he lands in that key phrase that's oftentimes said at funerals, an inspiration phrase, a phrase that just might be Paul's own personal mission statement. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's a great phrase in the English, but in the Greek, it's even more compact because it leaves out that word is in both of the statements. For me, to live, Christos, to die, Kerdos. Isn't that good? To live, Christos, to die, Kerdos. It's even more poetic in the Greek than it is in the English, and it's totally inspirational. For Paul, when he thinks about what life is all about, it's easy to define life is Jesus. Jesus is life. Easy definition, same thing. You know, people wear t-shirts these days about all the things that life is about. They might say, golf is life, or ball is life, or cross-stitch is life. <laughs> I don't actually know if there's a cross-stitch is life shirt out there. I'm just kind of imagining that one. But the truth of the matter is, if Paul had a t-shirt, his t-shirt would say, Jesus is life. Wake up, Jesus. Eat, Jesus. Study, Jesus. Conversations, Jesus. Work, Jesus. Go to bed, Jesus. Jesus is life. He is before all things. He is in all things. He is through all things. He is to all things. He is our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Redeemer, our Healer, our King who's coming, the one who is before all things, the one who will be after all things, and the one in whom all things hold together. His name is Jesus. And Paul says, to live is Christ. But then he gives us this little shocker statement afterwards, one that makes you kind of sit up and take notice, and that is, to die is gain. To live, Christos. To die, Kerdos. <laughs> and so you wonder, well, what is it, Paul, that makes death better than life? Why is that a gain in this equation? Well, for Paul, death is another way to say more Jesus, more Jesus. Because in death, it's Jesus face to face. In death, it's all of the people who are gathered together in Jesus' name, worshiping the king. In death, it's Jesus in uh, 4K and Dolby digital surround sound. It's Jesus at the next level. It's Jesus in 10 dimensions. It's Jesus having a brand new body that's perfectly able to worship him. It's taking off our crowns and throwing our trophies on the ground and bowing down before the one true king that our hearts have yearned for. This is why Paul can say, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul knows that trials are temporary. They have results. And the results, good or bad, lead to Jesus. No matter what it is, it's a win-win. Dr. Mike Murdoch said it this way. He said, losers focus on what they are going through. Champions focus on what they are going to. 
And if you want to be a champion for Jesus, you keep your focus on Jesus. You keep your focus on eternal life. You keep your focus on the hope that Jesus has for you, and you will become a champion for Jesus, adopting the mantra for, to me, to live Christos and to die Kerdos. You know, when I was in eighth grade, these verses in Philippians became very precious to me. Now, the truth about my life in eighth grade is that I had it pretty good, to be honest. My parents loved me. I had a safe home to go to at night. There's food on the table. I did pretty well in school, pretty bad in sports. But there were some things that happened to a lot of eighth graders that happened to me. The people who were my friends started making new friends and preferring those friends to hanging out with me, and I had a bunch of loneliness set in. And I had a smart mouth, and sometimes my smart mouth got me in trouble. In fact, a couple times it got me beat up on the playground. And uh, after those couple of times, I started asking myself some serious questions. Like, what is this life all about? And is life even worth living? I didn't go to the extreme lengths of actually making a plan to end my life, but I did ask myself the question, what's the value in staying alive at all? And I began to contemplate those existential thoughts. And while I was there, I started reading Philippians chapter 1. Now, I want to confess up front, I know that this was bad Bible study <laughs> that I was doing. I was making some assumptions that weren't really there in the text, but I'm amazed at how God meets us, even if we're 13 years old, even if we're doing bad hermeneutics, that the Spirit of God meets us in the moment where we're at. I wasn't actually even following Jesus at the time, but I was a church kid, and uh, I knew that people claimed that the Bible had answers. And so while I was in my moment of darkness and despair, I thought, okay, I'll try and look at the Bible. And I pulled a Bible off my shelf and prayed a little prayer. God, like if you care about me, and if you think life is worth living, then give me something from this book and help me to understand it. And so I opened up the book, stuck my finger on a page, and I landed in Philippians chapter 1. And these verses jumped off the page to me that day. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. And what happened in my mind is Paul's thinking about suicide too. That was my bad Bible study part. Paul was not really thinking about suicide. He was thinking about his execution. But I felt like here's someone who could relate to me. And I think... God wanted me to understand in the moment that he was nearby and was sending me a message. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me. 13 years old. And what God was saying to me was clear as day. You know, Paul says, if I remain in the body, this is a really good thing because it means fruitful labor. It means you, you Philippians, you get joy and progress in the faith. And when I come see you, you'll boast all the way until the day of Jesus. His, his whole reason for staying around is because there were other people whose lives might be changed if Paul stayed around, and this is why you continue on in the body, even though the fact that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And the word that God was sending to me that day is, you know, Mark, there may be some people someday, some of these Philippian people who you'll be able to encourage or touch their lives or help them in the progress of their faith. And I said, convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And so I decided to live on and continue moving forward. It, it was six years before I ever started following Jesus, and longer than that before I even considered doing any kind of ministry, and yet God was meeting me in that moment. You know, I can't help but think that maybe there's some people who are out there today who are in a dark place, a lonely place, 
maybe a place of despair. Maybe you're asking some of the same existential questions that I was asking when I was 13 years old. And I just want you to know that there's a God out there who has plans for your life. He's got people like the Philippians who he wants you to touch. He wants you to remain in the body so that you, so that you can help them progress in the joy and in their faith. They may be people you've never met before. They may be people who have not been born yet, but God has plans for you in your life. And it's even more than that. God has been using you. He has been touching people. If you did an inventory of your life and all of the people that you touched, you would be amazed at the way that God is using you in fruitful ways. This world matters. Death is better, but this world matters. And I pray that God gives you hope today. And I pray for all of us that we can live out that mantra, to live as Christ and to die as gain, and that we would predict our future, a future of joy, a future of hope, a future of confidence, and a future of life. Let's pray towards that. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray, God, that you'll help them to understand the life that there is in Jesus. I pray that they would see that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And God, I pray as we think about our future, we wouldn't think about it in terms of happiness based on circumstances, but our responses to those circumstances, to joy and life and strength and power and love. God, help us to live those things out every single day. And I do pray, God, particularly for people who are in a dark place right now. I just pray the light would crash in. I pray that this message will give them hope. I pray that they'll reorient their thinking based on the truth of the scriptures and that that would transform them from the inside out. So come, Holy Spirit, do your good work in every single person today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our healer, our sanctifier, and our coming King. Amen. Well, that was a good word about life with Jesus. And I know that sometimes our circumstances, like Mark said, don't feel as if there's much hope or there's much uh, joy. But I'm so glad, Lord, that you are ever present with us, even in our suffering, even in our doubt, even in our pain. And we can trust you, Lord. We just want to sing this one more time before we leave. And I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Is your faithfulness, oh, I will rest. Give us rest, Lord, in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness.
God, thank you for your goodness and your grace. We ask, God, that you would just continue to guide us, direct us, empower us, comfort us, lift us up by the promises of your spirit and the life that we have with you. So today, God, we ask that you would be the center of our thoughts, the center of our purposes, the center of our, our attitudes and our actions. And may you be glorified through us in Jesus' name.